Welcome to The Practice Podcast, a show created by lawyers to help lawyers in life and business without all the complicated lawyer language. Let's welcome Bast Amron founders and your hosts, Jeff Bast and Brett Amron. Hey, Jeff. Hi, Brett. How are you? I'm well. It's fine Wednesday. You just dated us. It's Uh, Wednesday. Well, it's Wednesday. We're recording this on a Wednesday and we have a special guest today. Our guest is Nicole Westbrook. Nicole is a commercial litigator with the law firm of Jones and Keller in Denver. She's a former federal law clerk in the busiest trial court in the United States. We're going to come back to that. Nicole is also an instructor for the National Institute for Trial Advocacy, also known as NIDA. She's a frequent writer and a speaker on legal issues and litigation practice, and she has racked up numerous awards for excellence in the law. Congratulations on that. We're excited to have Nicole as our guest on the Practice Podcast, so welcome, Nicole. Thank you. It's great to be here. I appreciate you guys having me on today. Fantastic. You're dialing in. We're doing this over a video conference. Nicole is in Denver. Is that right? I am in Denver. And as I was saying before we got started, right, we're on the very quick decline to the snow season. So things are changing here. I know you guys still have a nice hot (laughs) summer on you, but we are headed out of summer. Count us jealous. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. We'll be there soon enough. Give us a little bit of your background, you know, where you're from, how you became a lawyer. Sure. I grew up in Wyoming, out in the country, which I think really all of Wyoming is the country. I'm guessing none of you have ever actually met someone from Wyoming. I think there are around four or 500,000 of us, so that's Hmm. not a lot. So I grew up in Wyoming and then went to law school in Nashville, Tennessee at Vanderbilt, which was a great education and a, a, a good resource. And When we were there, they were pushing everyone really hard into going into clerkship if possible. And I wasn't quite sure what the value of that clerkship was at the outset. It has definitely become apparent that 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 is a real asset for you throughout your career. I think some of the small stuff is, you know, you get familiar with the courtroom and familiar with the staff and how cases are staffed internally by the court system and who a clerk is and who the court security officers are, things like that. And all those little things lead you to be more effective when you actually get out and you're an associate in a big firm. So uh, you're also less fearful of the entire judiciary, I think. You get yelled at plenty while you're there as a clerk. And then, you know, the the, the luster of that getting yelled at by a judge really wears off. And so <laughs> then you're you're well prepared <laughs> yeah, to go in that's funny. and start fighting your own cases after you leave a clerkship. So after that clerkship, which was in a federal court in Texas, headed up to Denver, Colorado, and started at a big law firm as a, an associate, cog in a wheel sort of thing. And worked my way up and found my way now to Jones and Keller since 2014, which is a mid-sized Colorado firm and love it. So we're doing, we're doing good work. We're doing big work and helping a lot of clients. Fantastic. I want to circle back to the clerkship. One other small thing that you learned, because I'm also a former law clerk, is the microphones. I'm still amazed to this day that there are lawyers in courtrooms who don't know that the mics are wired to chambers. <laughs> and so when you're sitting at counsel table and you're speaking, they can hear you. And that's something I learned as a law clerk. And I'm just amazed to this day, people still don't, don't know or they act like they don't know anyways. Oh, absolutely. I'm terrified of it, in fact, right? I'm the first one to be hitting that button when I walk into a courtroom to mute it and pointing to it and telling my client, don't say anything. The judge is standing in chambers listening to this. And I remember as a clerk, the dial for the volume was right outside of my office door. And oftentimes you'd see the judge walk by and turn that dial up and stand there for a few minutes listening to what was going on. And I think uh, it was within my first month of clerking there was a visiting judge that had come down from San Antonio and was yelling at some attorneys in the courtroom. And we were standing there listening to him and he was saying, yes, counselor, I got your pleading. And I wrote on the top of it, AYC. Counsel, do you know what AYC means? Uh, No, your honor. Are you crazy? (laughs) (laughs) AYC, I like that. I'm going to have to use that. (laughs) So uh, among the many reasons why you would want to clerk, right? You're, we're hearing that you get a lot of insight right behind the scenes so that you could take that and adapt and use it 
when you become a lawyer and sort of switch sides, if you will, and jump out on the other side of the bench, if somebody is coming out of law school and they're contemplating, hey, I've got, I've got loans, I've got to do it, like, what would you tell them if they're considering a clerkship versus going right into the practice, some of the pros and of doing that versus, you know, going into private practice? You know, that's a great question. And it's so tough coming out of law school. I think most of us come out of law school flat broke and having mountains of debt. And kind of, if you didn't have all of your friends go into, you know, higher education, or you didn't have all of your friends going into graduate programs, you start seeing them get out and they're buying new cars and you're still driving the same car that you're you got <laughs> cobbled together from high school. And, you know, it's really hard because that flashy money from the big firms is, is very appealing and very alluring. But what I've noticed, and certainly there's all sorts of different firms and, and different paths to get to the same place. But what I really noticed is that as a young person, if you go into the big firm and you definitely you'd make that money, and I think it's even better today than it was when I was coming out of my clerkship. But if you go directly to that big firm, you do a lot of document review and it's a labor intensive thing, but you're not getting a lot of courtroom time you're not getting a lot of even drafting motions practice. You're kind of, you know, you're the you're the cog in the big wheel. You are doing a lot of memos and prepping partners to go do their job. And so you're not getting a lot of training. And I noticed that some of those colleagues of mine who went that big law path, they were quite behind the eight ball, in my opinion. They weren't prepared to walk in and give an oral argument. They were very afraid of the courtroom. So I think that although the clerkship, it does it's a huge bite out of the chunk of money you receive. I mean, maybe what, a third, maybe a fourth of what you could make. But I think the real practice that you get and the real insight into the bench and watching other people, you know, put their skill sets on on a daily basis and how they handle problems and how they handle the judges and even style points, right? Watching different litigators, different trial attorneys and how they do it on their feet you learn a lot just by watching that. So it's a tough choice to go out. I guess I would just say, do the clerkship, the money will come, right? Stay poor for another couple of years, you'll be all right. <laughs> so it's a long game, right? I mean, that's that's the view, yeah. right? And that's hard. That's hard. That's like you said, that is a hard thing for somebody coming out in debt and staring at potentially, depending on what their opportunities are, looking at you know a potential big payday on the front end as opposed to waiting a couple of years. Yeah. And at the end, uh, somebody told me this because I was, I did two one year clerkships, two different courts. And before the second one, before I accepted the second one, I asked advice of a, a seasoned attorney. And he said, look, at the end of 20 years, your peers are going to have 20 years of practice and you're going to have 18 and two clerkships. And, you know, really no difference in terms of the practice, but you'll have that, you, you know, that unique perspective and experience you just mentioned. So I'm told that you're, Clerkship was with the busiest trial court in the United States. What court is that? That was at the time you clerked. What does it mean, busy? Does that mean the, just purely on the docket? Or tell us what that means and why was it so busy? Trials. It was the busiest trial court. And so it was Western District of Texas. And during that time, the Western District of Texas surpassed the Eastern District of Texas with the amount of trial work that was being done. And I think that the issue was, uh, at the time, there were a lot of criminal trials that were running in that division. And a lot of it had to focus on the border and the way the, you know, the politics and the, and the law surrounding what was going on with the border at the time. And so at the time, there was a lot of drug trafficking, a lot of alien trafficking, and, you know, a lot of illegal entries and, and re-entries. So we were running trials back to back down there, sometimes a couple a week. Sometimes we were extending trials into weekends, even keeping juries through the weekend because the docket was so crushing, which, you know, most of the time we don't have that going on. And you see what a big deal that would be to keep a jury over a mm. weekend, but we just had no choice. Now here in Colorado, you know, our trial dockets are not as big and so, you know, you know, you walk in for a normal day of a jury trial, you're lucky if you get six hours with that jury. But we were in the Western District of Texas, often keeping juries, you know, late into the evening, into the weekends, things like that. So, yeah, it was a very, very busy trial docket. So, as I said earlier, I got to see a lot of 
fantastic attorneys with a lot of different styles put on performances and watch those over and over. Mm. And then I guess my favorite part for each trial would have been afterwards, we got to walk in and talk to the jury. And the judge always made a big effort to say, you know, what did you like? What didn't you like? What can we do better next time? And boy, you start talking to those jurors and what they saw and what they heard and what they thought of the different lawyers and the different clients in the courtroom. You learn a lot about what you're going to do or not do when you start standing on your feet as a trial lawyer. That's an amazing experience. I mean, a lot of lot of jurisdictions have not maybe not the flood of of the border issues, perhaps that that the district you're in has, but but they have a lot of cases and, and busy dockets, but they don't have as many trials. So, is there something that you sort of learned while you're doing that? Why there were so many trials as opposed to yes, there's going to be a lot of cases and a lot of activity, but a lot of cases would play out even on the criminal side. Yeah, I mean, I think it was just a crushing load of work. And so Mm -hmm. even though a lot of criminal cases do plead out, and of course, most civil cases do plead out, they were still running. I think that there was just a huge backlog in the legal system. I mean, we're kind of seeing it again right now, right? With COVID, you're seeing jury trials stacked three or four deep, and you get about two weeks before your trial, and the judge says, yeah, you're not going. It's going to be somebody else. But it was like that, and the backlog was so long in the Western District of Texas, and I just don't think there was anything else that could be done. We just had to keep running trial after trial, and the poor judge, Hmm. I I know she was exhausted. I'm sure. So let's fast forward a little. You're also an instructor at NIDA. Can you tell, for any of the listeners who are not familiar with NIDA, can you tell us a little bit about that, what it is, and your role? Absolutely. National Institute of Trial Advocacy It's NITA, NIDA. And what that does, it's a great program because there seems to be a huge gap between what we learn in law school versus what it takes to stand on your feet and perform in a trial. And it doesn't seem like that's covered, really. There there are some good trial advocacy programs in your law schools, and you may have done some of that. Or there are some good debate classes, maybe in college, and maybe you've done some of that. But things like that you would never think of, how to take a deposition how to defend a deposition, those sorts of things. No one ever teaches you that. There's no deposition class in law school, but it's a huge part of what you're going to do as a civil litigator. And getting the tips and the tricks of how you get those done in an efficient manner and how you get the information you need, what's appropriate as an objection, what's not appropriate, how you handle difficult witnesses, how you handle difficult opposing counsel. So that's one of the types of classes that I teach a lot of is uh, deposition skills. And then, of course, the other big class that Nita does that we love to teach is the trial skills class. And that that class is running five to seven days, depending on kind of the layout and, you know, the timing and things like that. I think we've, we've shortened it down just a bit for COVID. So I think it's now more like five days. But boy, it's an intense, intense five days. It's, you know, maybe 10 hours a day. And then afterwards, you have homework just like you're in law school. and Or in trial, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely in trial. So you're going back after you finish your day and you're on your feet as a as a student, you're on your feet giving an opening statement, giving a cross examination, examining an expert and it's videotaped. And then you have to go watch yourself of how you did. It's just grueling. And then, of course, you get home at night and you need to prepare for the next day because you're doing something different the next day and you have people critiquing you and helping you. And so it's a difficult class, a difficult program, but by the time that you get done with it, you've learned a whole lot about what you're trying to do and how you can take that forward into your trials or your depositions. And so I think it gives young lawyers a ton of confidence and it's a skill set that is missing, I think, in our education. Where is that given? Is it given in one area? Is it in person now? Back post-COVID, is it in person where can somebody go if they're a young lawyer and they want to, you know, join or, or, or take the course? Yeah. So I, they put them on all over in different places across the United States. We mm-hmm. try to spread them out so that they are in locales that are convenient to a bunch of different lawyers. I usually participate in the ones here in Colorado. They are in person. They've been in Denver lately. And There's also usually a good one in in Dallas. I know they used to put them on at SMU. I'm not sure if they still do, but yeah, they spread them all over and 
sometimes Nita even goes into certain um, organizations or law firms and, and presents directly at those locations. So it's uh, very accessible. There's, of course, a website and just get on the website and find something close to you that fits with your schedule and be prepared to really work. And we'll put the website in the show notes for anybody who may want to attend. And if you want to go see Nicole in live and in action, you go to at work, you go go to Denver. Have you seen any sort of change and shift, you know, now that jury trials are back in person and all that, you know, post COVID, I think, have you seen any shift in how, in your approach, taking some lessons from COVID for trial? Well, I tell you, I just finished a jury trial a little more than a week ago, and I felt really rusty. (laughs) (laughs) That's my takeaway from COVID was, boy, where did where did all of the people go? Right. Right. Um, I haven't I haven't been able to be in front of a jury. I I lost my last jury trial to COVID was supposed to be March 30th of 2020. And it Mm. was, I think, about a week and a half before that jury trial that it was vacated because of COVID. And so since then. I haven't been able to get in in front of a jury. You know, we did a lot of work remotely, but there were very few courts that were willing to even consider having a remote jury. And and I think that that would be really, really hard. I know that some places tried to test that, but I think that would be really, really hard to maintain anyone's attention or focus over video, right? It's hard enough to maintain a jury's focus in person for a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, doing it via video is almost impossible, I would say. Agreed. But I guess the one thing I would say is you will see each of their faces up close, which would be a unique perspective. But yeah, I agree. Looking at us, it would really be unfair to a jury to expect them to sit there and look at a screen all day like that. It's already hard enough to, like you said, keep their attention throughout the course of a trial. I almost found it more exhausting for things like bench trials or evidentiary hearings that you're putting on, even arbitrations that you're doing via Zoom or some other platform. You know, and I would take breaks. I had an argument in front of a federal judge in Utah via Zoom, and I just sat there watching her nodding off during argument. And it was extremely uncomfortable to try to (laughs) raise your voice or make some noise or something to see if you couldn't uh, get her attention. You know, you had to be super prepared in order to use the video platform. It took a lot of front end preparation and then lots of breaks and lots of stopping to try to get somebody's attention. So, mm. yeah, I think that the video platform was great. We all learned a lot and learned how to do a great job with it, but it definitely has its drawbacks. And so I'm thrilled to be back in front of a jury in person. So, what happened jury trial last week, right? Did you win? <laughs> well, It's a matter of opinion, but technically, no. (laughs) Technically, no. (laughs) Yeah, so after five days of evidence, we had the jury come back for another day, and it was after the Labor Day weekend. And so there was a three-day break in between. And I walk into the courtroom after the three-day break so that the jury can continue its deliberations, and there's no judge. And pretty soon the judge comes on, the audio system, and you can't see him through any of the video because the court really isn't set up for video. And so the judge comes in via audio and he says, I got COVID over the weekend. And so I can't be there with you, but go ahead and bring the jury in and I'll tell them to reread the instructions and to go, you know, deliberate and keep working. And so his law clerk brings the jury in and the jury's kind of looking around, where's the judge? And then this disembodied voice comes on over the speaker system and tells the jury, thanks for coming back. Try to remember everything over the long three-day weekend. Go reread the instructions and then keep deliberating. So the jury goes out and they come back in around noon with a question. And the question was, what if we're five to one? <laughs> and so the judge, the disembodied voice, brings the jury in and right. says to them, hey, guys, it's noon. Take a break, right? Take a break and go get some lunch, come back and keep trying. Less than an hour later, we get a phone call that there is a verdict. And so we go in to take the verdict and a new judge walks in. Oh, so some judge that we've never seen before comes in and she's got a robe on. I think my client was so confused. He didn't even know whether to stand up. So I pull him out of his seat and she comes in and she says, okay, we have a verdict. I'll take the verdict. And the jury comes in and they hand the verdict up to the new judge. And she takes a look at it. And she says, okay, well, I see that you didn't fill in the second question. 
I got a special interrogatory verdict form as opposed to what I prefer, which is a general verdict form. But so in the special interrogatory verdict form, the second question wasn't filled in. And she says, okay, I see that that's not filled in. Is that on purpose? And the jury says, yes. And she said, okay, well, I think we have a hung jury and I'm going to declare the mistrial. Uh. And so that was it. I was able to speak with the jury afterwards and they said we were five to one in your favor. And so you know how devastating and deflating that yeah. is to get five to one, to get so close to everything that you wanted out of the trial, and then to have to tuck all of that information away. And in about a month, I'll go back up to that court and reset the trial. And in who knows what, three to six months, maybe I can get in front of a new jury and do it all again. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. So I do think there are certainly some drawbacks and I think there's benefits to being in the courtroom, you know, and having everybody live and for various reasons, as you mentioned and and others, I do think there's some use for the platform going forward for, you know, video attendance and things like that. I do think that we've learned from that. I had uh, an issue recently. I attended a hearing, non-evidentiary, it was summary judgment and it was the court's you know, link, I dialed in, everything, whatever, they could barely hear me, which was super frustrating. I had to then, I called in my phone. And so I'm holding my phone as I'm appearing on video, <laughs> trying to, you know, get to my argument. And there's definitely drawbacks, but I do think that there are some benefits. And I hope that, you know, for purposes of motion calendar, things like that, that, that it'll stick around. One of the best benefits, I think, is the idea that you can have a witness anywhere still appear. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's always been difficult to talk a judge into letting a witness appear remotely at trial. The courtrooms weren't set up for it and nobody was comfortable with it. Even having somebody call in who was, you know, a third party witness that you couldn't talk into coming to your trial. The judges were loath to do that. And there used to always be a lot of fighting over whether somebody could appear remotely. I think those days are gone. I think that we're all now really comfortable with people appearing remotely. And it even makes you wonder, you know, we've got these subpoena rules about how far away from the courthouse somebody can be for a witness and you subpoena them. Doesn't matter anymore, right? right? Do we really need to be concerned about that? Because if somebody could appear remotely for a couple of hours, do we really worry about that subpoena power anymore? I think that's a great point, right? And I think that it used to be, you know, dial in by phone or you'd have some elaborate setup with a, a trial company, right, to, you know, have the, somebody appear by video or now it's super easy to have that, right? Like you said, as you're appearing here by, you know, by video, it's super easy to do that in courts now. So I think that may lend itself to some rules changes with the subpoenas and attendance of witnesses and things like that. Great point. And it is, to me, it's just a benefit. You know, it, it should not be a replacement, but a way to augment the trial process and a way to streamline, you know, the testimony, things like that, and motion calendar. I, and I think, you know, we've talked about this, Brett and I have on other, on a, other episodes, but just some cases lend themselves to in-person appearances. And I hope that judges use that requirement as a tool you know, some cases, fine, let them appear by video, but there's sometimes when the lawyers need to be hauled into court and face the judge face to face in person. And I think a lot of cases, you know, think about how many resolutions we reach on the courthouse steps. I mean, that's not just a, you know, a term that that term is by design. It is actually true. It's absolutely true. And it's my strong preference to be in person. I do think you get more done. I do think there's more pomp and circumstance to it. You know, I've, I've had arguments that I thought were so important doing them over video that I, I stand up. I elevate my computer and stand up to do them because you just don't have the same amount of pressure sitting back in your chair. And so you're trying to change that dynamic. But yeah, every day of the week, my strong preference is to be in person. But we look at costs too. And one of the most difficult things that we do, I think, in our profession is trying to figure out how to run a smaller case on a budget. You know, there are smaller cases that are good cases and people who deserve justice on those as well. But you can't run a small case the same way you run a big case. And so some of the ways that you can really cut out some of those fees and costs is to appear remotely for things or 
to take a deposition remotely rather than traveling for a couple yeah. of days. So yeah. some of that I think is, is really, really helpful to what we're trying to do as a profession. Yeah. Great tool. And hopefully, you know, we can use it going forward in the right manner in the right cases, but it's, it's not going to be for every case and ever for every hearing clearly. Well, I, don't envy you having to try that case again, but I imagine that the experience and what you learned from those five jurors, maybe not, or maybe what you learned from that one juror, I don't know if you got the benefit of learning who it was, but maybe you can sit down with that one juror and figure out what went wrong or, or how, what you can change on the next go around, but good luck with that. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I did talk to the one juror and he was very adamant. He said, as a plaintiff, you have to prove it. And so he did not like the standard of proof. More likely than not. Right. So he care for that, <laughs> and he's not that kind of guy. And yeah. that does inform my voir dire, which I guess you have to go back to some of the old questionings. The old stodgy questions maybe are some of the best ones. And I haven't asked a jury in a very long time whether they would follow the rules as the court puts them out. I'm going to throw that one back in my repertoire. Yeah. Great lesson. Yeah, I think you found the, the person that won't. Right. So I think that's a, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Nicole, this has been a lot of fun for the listeners out there. We have Nicole's information in the show notes. If you want to reach out to her or, or take a class with her, contact her. Otherwise, if you like this episode, please give us a five-star review, follow the show, share us with your friends and family, and we will see you next time. Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Thank Nicole. You, Nelson. Thank Brett. you, Nelson. Thank you. Good luck in your next trial, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, guys. For more information on this show and other resources, visit FastAmron.com and connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at FastAmron.